On June 10th, 2018, the atmosphere in Ohio was filled with optimism as the day began. The local pizza hut in St. Clairsville, Ohio, was bustling with its regular patrons, including Joni D. Davis and Brian Edgar Goff. The couple had a delightful dinner, and as they finished, Brian, the dedicated 64-year-old caretaker, escorted 55-year-old Joni to their light blue 1990 Oldsmobile 88 four-door sedan. However, after that moment, the whereabouts of the sedan and its occupants became a mystery, as they seemed to have disappeared without a trace. Ohio, a state shaped by the natural borders of Lake Erie and the Ohio River, offers a delightful blend of vibrant cities, unspoiled natural landscapes, and picturesque farms. Whether you're planning a short weekend getaway or a longer vacation, Ohio has plenty to offer. Proudly known as Ohioans, residents of this state enjoy a relatively affordable cost of living compared to other states. The Ohio River serves as a vital commercial route for residents of Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana, and Illinois. Little did they know that the Ohio River would conceal the lives of a lovely couple for over three years. Our tale begins right here in Ohio on September 21, 1953, when Ralph and Olga Jean welcomed twin baby boys, Brian Edgar Goff and Colin Goff, in Martins Ferry, Ohio. After their mother's passing, Brian was raised by his great-aunt, Hannah Goff, on a farm near Martins Ferry. He later moved to Saybrook, Ohio, with his twin brother, older brother, and sister. Brian graduated from Harbor High School in Ashtabula, Ohio, in June 1971, and went on to work for Penn Central and Conrail Railroads in Cleveland and Mingo Junction. He eventually returned to the Martins Ferry area, where he shared a home with Colin and worked at Goff Trucking near Rayland. Brian was known for his loving, caring, and hard-working nature, always sporting a genuine smile. He cherished family gatherings and was a devoted fan of the Cleveland Browns and Cleveland Indians. In addition to all this, Brian dedicated himself to caring for Joni D. Davis, a loving sister to Jackie Newell and a doting aunt to her nephews, born to Jack and Joanne on July 20, 1962. Joni and Brian, both esteemed healthcare workers, embarked on a beautiful relationship over two decades ago. Tragically, their love story took a complicated turn when Joni, at the age of 35, fell into a coma. After months of battling, Joni emerged from the shadows of unconsciousness, but the damage to her brain was irreversible, necessitating round-the-clock care. Brian, the epitome of unwavering devotion, assumed the role of Joni's caretaker without a second thought. Their unbreakable bond endured the test of time until the fateful year of 2018. The scorching June sun painted Ohio in breathtaking hues, setting the stage for a seemingly ordinary Sunday. Little did Brian and Joni know that their routine visit to Pizza Hut in St. Clairsville would mark the end of an era. As the clock struck 7 p.m., Brian led Joni to their vintage 1990 Oldsmobile 88, adorned with Ohio license plate EYA7482. Their family anticipated the usual pit stops at the gas station, Reese Cups, and the lottery ticket outlet. However, as the night wore on, silence enveloped the worried hearts of Joni's loved ones. Brian and Joni vanished into thin air, leaving behind a trail of unanswered questions and a void that echoed with their absence. Joni's family members were quick to notice the mysterious disappearance of the couple. They immediately headed to Brian and Joni's luxurious home on Coleraine Pike, where they discovered their belongings meticulously laid out, clothes, medications, credit cards, money, and other essentials. It was evident that the couple never made it back home. Following Brian and Joni's usual routine, the family deduced that they must have gone to Pizza Hut. After reviewing the surveillance footage at the Pizza Hut, it became clear that the couple did not continue on National Road through Bridgeport. The family speculated that they might have taken Interstate 70 to Route 214 or Charmont Road. Without hesitation, Joni's family decided to alert the Belmont County Sheriff's Office about the missing couple. When questioned about Brian and Joni's appearance and whereabouts, 
The family described Brian as a 5-foot, 10-inch tall man, weighing approximately 190 pounds, while Joni was a 5-foot, 2-inch tall woman, weighing around 138 pounds. Joni's sister's fiancé, Paul Newell, shared details about the Pizza Hut surveillance video, emphasizing that the couple wouldn't have embarked on a spontaneous trip. Armed with this information, the Belmont County Sheriff's Department launched a thorough investigation. Despite a week of relentless search efforts by both officials and family members, Brian and Joni remained elusive. While rumors of a murder-suicide circulated in Ohio, Joni's family remained steadfast in their belief that the couple was still alive. The search continued for over nine days, with the family collaborating closely with law enforcement. Finally, a breakthrough came when surveillance footage from a local gas station indicated that Brian and Johnny were last seen heading north. Convinced that the investigation needed to shift in that direction, the family's hopes were reignited when officials traced Brian's cell phone to their last known location. The cell phone's final ping was detected in the vicinity of Little Rush Run, near the Rayland Marina in Ohio. Consequently, authorities conducted multiple searches for Brian and Johnny in that specific area. A reward of $5,000 was offered by the sheriff's offices in Jefferson and Belmont counties for any information that could lead to locating the missing couple. Both law enforcement agencies utilized aerial surveillance and surface searches with trained canines since the summer of 2018. Even Martin's Ferry Councilman closely monitored the case, hoping for a miraculous return of the two individuals. Yet unfortunately, no leads emerged. Despite Ohio experiencing all seasons, the grieving family's sorrow remained unchanged. Johnny's family members simply desired closure. After three and a half years since Brian and Joni's disappearance, the Chaos Divers arrived at the Ohio River to search for Karen Adams, drawing attention to the couple's case. As many are aware, Chaos Divers are altruistic individuals who initially began as an environmental cleanup group to enhance aquatic life, eventually evolving into selfless heroes. The diving angels firmly believed that individuals who had been missing with a vehicle for an extended period had a high likelihood of being located in the water. Initially encountering people by chance, they now purposefully travel across the country, striving to provide closure to families of the missing, which is their ultimate goal. Upon learning about Brian and Joni, the diving team in the area was determined not to depart for Illinois without attempting to locate them. The real-life diving angels meticulously gathered all available information regarding the couple's last known whereabouts and cell phone pings. Confirming the last location to be in the vicinity of Little Rush Run, the Chaos Divers recognized the Ohio River as the closest body of water. Subsequently, the diving teams resolved to search for Brian and Joni there. This significant event took place on November 11, 2021. The Chaos Divers team, equipped with their motorboats, embarked on a mission to locate Brian and Joni. Utilizing their sonar technology and magnet, they successfully located the vehicle. As the diving angels plunged into the water, the sky gradually darkened. Promptly, they informed the FBI, Ohio Bureau Criminal Investigation Crime Scene Unit, and Jefferson County officials. A thorough discussion ensued regarding the vehicle's recovery, culminating in a plan to extract it from the water the next day. At dawn in Ohio, the diving angels discovered that the license plate belonged to a light blue 1990 Oldsmobile 88 four-door sedan. The sedan was submerged in eight feet of water, approximately 15 feet from the shoreline, with the missing couple still strapped in their seatbelts. Remarkably, the vehicle was found just a mile south of where the couple's cell phone had last pinged. With meticulous care, the Jefferson County officials and chaos divers successfully retrieved the car, along with the human remains. Autopsies were deemed necessary to confirm identities and determine the causes of death, as mentioned by the officials. A team of forensic experts was slated to process the vehicle for evidence collection. Subsequently, the medical examiner confirmed the identities of the deceased as Brian and Joni. The discovery of their bodies 
after more than three years of being missing, provided closure to the case. The law enforcement officers developed a friendly rapport with the Chaos Divers team, with one of the sheriffs even treating the diving angels to dinner. Additionally, the Toronto Fire Department's assistance with cylinder refills was a heartwarming gesture. The Chaos Divers truly deserved recognition for bringing relief to the family members, who can now find solace in knowing that their loved ones are no longer missing. The Christmas of 1977 brought a miraculous gift to 15-year-old Marissa, reuniting her with her biological sister. However, this joy was short-lived, as tragedy struck just three months later. After a lovely weekend with her sister, Marissa's lifeless body was found near Sutro Heights Park in San Francisco on March 28, 1978. The investigation into this heartbreaking event began immediately, but little did the detectives know that it would take over 40 years to solve the case. What could have transpired during Marissa's trip to San Francisco? Who could have inflicted such horror upon a young girl? San Francisco, with its diverse and captivating beauty, is a city that draws people from all corners of the globe. Situated between the iconic Golden Gate Bridge and the picturesque hills of the Bay Area, this city offers a varied landscape that transitions from vibrant city streets to serene beaches and charming parks. It is a place of endless excitement and rapid-paced living, providing countless opportunities for career growth, a lively social scene that never rests, and a dynamic entrepreneurial environment that fuels creativity and innovation. San Francisco is a city of allure, contrast, and mystery, where dreams and reality intertwine seamlessly. Despite its reputation as one of the safest major cities in the nation, a tragic cold case unfolded at Sutro Heights Park in 1978, when the lifeless body of a 15-year-old girl named Marissa Rolf Harvey was discovered. Born in 1963 in New York, Marissa was an orphan with no known biological relatives. Adopted at a young age by a family in Port Washington, New York, she was described by her adoptive mother, Marguerite Schultz, as a unique and adventurous soul. Marissa's love for exploration and helping others defined her character, whether she was riding horses through the hills of her hometown or traveling across Europe in search of new experiences. Her compassionate nature shone through in her acts of kindness towards her elderly neighbors, embodying the true spirit of a caring and adventurous soul. As she settled into her new life with her adoptive family, a hidden longing to uncover the mysteries of her biological roots lingered within her. Time flew by, and before she knew it, Marissa had reached the age of 15. Then, on that momentous Christmas day in 1977, destiny began to weave its intricate tapestry. Little did she realize that her life was on the brink of a remarkable transformation. The air was filled with festive cheer, as Marissa's family reveled in the joy of December 25th, 1977. A mysterious figure by the name of Miriam Wadif graced their home in Port Washington. With a startling revelation, Miriam claimed to be Marissa's long-lost sister. She disclosed her tireless pursuit, aided by a professional research firm, to reunite with her cherished younger sibling. Standing before Marissa, Miriam extended an invitation beckoning her to journey to San Francisco and meet her biological family. Was this a Christmas miracle or a twist of fate? Marissa seized the opportunity, eager to connect with her long-lost kin. Initially hesitant, her parents eventually relented, understanding the significance of this momentous occasion. With the promise that Miriam would look after her, Marissa's parents agreed to let her embark on this journey during the upcoming Easter break of 1978. Anticipation mounted as Marissa eagerly awaited her solo trip to San Francisco. Finally, the day arrived. On a crisp Friday morning, March 24, 1978, the plane landed at San Francisco International Airport. Miriam welcomed Marissa with open arms, leading her to the apartment where she resided. Overwhelmed with excitement, Marissa embraced the holiday season with her newfound sister by her side. After indulging in a few of the most exquisite days with her sister, it was nearly time to depart for home, yet the fun was far from over. 
On the final day of her journey, on March 27th, she made a delightful request to Miriam for a horseback riding adventure. Unable to resist her little sister's innocent plea, Miriam had to oblige, despite her professional commitments as a graduate student and instructor at the prestigious San Francisco Institute. In order to fulfill her promise, she arranged for a friend to escort Marissa to the stables in her place. Little did they know that the stables were closed that day, leading Marissa's friend to drop her off at the Golden Gate Park stables instead. Upon returning home from work, Miriam was alarmed to find Marissa missing. She wasted no time in reporting her sister's disappearance, as the weekend was meant to be a memorable one for Marissa, culminating her time with her beloved sister. Unfortunately, tragedy struck instead. What was supposed to be the final day with her sister in San Francisco turned out to be the last day of her life. The following evening, on March 28, 1978, a young man strolling in Sutro Heights Park near the Cliff House stumbled upon a pair of tiny feet protruding from a bush and promptly dialed 911. The police arrived at the scene and discovered Marissa's lifeless body in the bushes along a pedestrian trail. Miriam identified her sister, and it was evident to the authorities that Marissa had been a victim of a heinous crime. Coroner Boyd Stuffin's report revealed that she had been brutally assaulted, strangled with a cord-like object, and violated. Despite an extensive investigation by the San Francisco Police Department, utilizing cutting-edge technology and following every lead, the perpetrator remained elusive. A DNA sample was recovered from the crime scene, yet justice seemed out of reach. After the absence of superior technologies hindered the progress of the investigation, the evidence found failed to provide any leads for the authorities. Despite the swift recovery of the victim's body and all available evidence, investigators were left without any suspects to pursue. With a lack of evidence and no clear direction to follow, the case quickly turned cold. For 42 years, the case remained inactive until the department's cold case team reopened it in October 2020. Finally, the family of the teenage girl who was tragically killed over four decades ago can find some closure. San Francisco Police Chief Bill Scott conveyed his sentiments in a statement acknowledging the relentless efforts of Marissa Harvey's family to seek justice for her. He strongly believed that the resolution of the case was long overdue and the family deserved answers. The police immediately employed advanced investigative techniques to resume the search for the perpetrator, although they did not disclose the specifics of these methods. A collaborative task force comprising the San Francisco Police Department Homicide Unit, the San Francisco District Attorney's Office, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office in Colorado delved deeper into the case. San Francisco District Attorney Chesa Boudin revealed that the breakthrough came when investigators accessed a third-party DNA database and identified genetic material from a relative, leading to the identification of a 76-year-old man named Mark Personette. The diligent efforts of the police and the extensive investigation eventually paid off, as Personette's DNA matched a sample found at the crime scene on March 15, 2021. Consequently, the San Francisco Police Department apprehended Personette in suburban Denver on the same day, arresting him just 35 miles southwest of his residence in Conifer, Colorado. Following the apprehension, a collaborative effort between the San Francisco Police, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office was meticulously planned. Personette was formally accused of a single count of homicide on the distinguished date of Thursday, December 16, 2021. To ascertain any potential links between Personette and other unresolved cases involving the tragic demise of young women due to physical assaults, the San Francisco police have fervently implored law enforcement agencies across the nation to diligently scour their archives. Furthermore, Personette's historical mugshots, including those captured by the authorities in New Jersey, were made readily accessible. During interviews with Personette's neighbors, they expressed disbelief at the accusations, although they admitted to being slightly taken aback. Avery Aubin, a resident in close proximity, recounted peculiar encounters with Personette, such as observing him walk backwards down the street. 
Ralph Bratt, another neighbor, described Personette as amiable yet peculiar. Public records indicate that Personette was remanded in Jefferson County sans bail for the heinous crime of murdering a young girl, with a pivotal hearing scheduled for January 10, 2022. The presence of legal representation for Personette remained uncertain. Subsequently, during the court proceedings on January 10, 2022, it was disclosed that Personette had been previously detained for a series of assaults that transpired in October and November 1979 across various locales in New Jersey, including Somerville, Bernard's Township, and Hopewell Township. One of the harrowing incidents involved the purported enticement of a 16-year-old girl into his vehicle under the guise of offering her a ride, only to subject her to a traumatic ordeal in the woods of Basking Ridge, New Jersey. Despite the ordeal, the courageous victim managed to seek refuge in a nearby residence, providing a detailed description of her assailant and the vehicle involved. SF Gate, a prominent local news source in the San Francisco Bay Area, reported that Personette had been arrested and charged with aggravated assault back in 1980, managing to escape before facing trial. Decades later, history seemed to repeat itself, but this time there was no escape. On a fateful Thursday, January 21, 2022, Personette stood before the court in San Francisco, accused of the murder of Marissa Harvey. Despite attempts to reach his lawyer, Adam Gassner, for comment, no response was received. Gassner later confirmed that Personette had pleaded not guilty to the charges, emphasizing the need for a thorough defense investigation due to the age of the case. In January 2022, Personette was formally charged with the killing of 15-year-old Marissa. While details of the case remained undisclosed, it was clear that Personette would face justice. San Francisco District Attorney Chesa Boudin assured that the police were diligently working to ensure Personette faced severe consequences for his heinous actions that took Marissa's life. After a 44-year pursuit for justice, the perpetrator was finally identified. In 2024, Marissa would have been 61 years old, possibly a grandmother with a family of her own. She was just a young girl when her promising future was tragically cut short.